Thank you for watching the World Community Magazine's Hour of Power Live on Facebook with your host Edward McQueen and April Garner. You're muted, Brother Edward. You're muted, Brother Edward. <laughs> I'm muted. No, I'm, not I'm muted talking anymore. hard, too. Just, just talking. Yeah, I'm just talking, man. You know why? Because I'm excited today. <laughs> You're excited. But it's like a, it's like a first-run movie. Uh, our young people in politics, you know, doesn't get any better than that. Okay? It doesn't. Like it doesn't. And somebody to back them up along with them. I oh, know. Iconic huh? leaders, young leaders. Oh, uh, yes, yes. The future is bright. The future, future is bright. Is bright. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. I'm your host, Ed McQueen. And of course, this April Garner, WCM Live is co-host. Um, always with her. So, um, yeah. So, uh, as I said, as I said before, it's like a first run movie, April. We're showcasing some of our, 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 our youth that we've been uh talking about for, for a long time and now you know it's like a first run movie so we start off with, with our politics with our uh showcasing the importance of, of the black representation in politics itself so april um why don't you just you know just take things and run away mm -hmm. so you want to do that yeah sure no problem so, <laughs> <laughs> so today we have uh three uh, very bright stars in uh, politics today in South Carolina and also locally. Uh, they are members of the Democratic Party, but of course, we always want to preface any type of show where we are discussing political issues by saying that we are a nonpartisan show. We welcome anyone who is willing to come on and talk about their platforms and their side uh, of politics so that we can have a, a a great understanding of how great it works yes across the spectrum, across the spectrum. Um, and i think that that's what helps us to eliminate the misunderstandings and to close a lot of gaps but we can't that's do it if we don't unite as a community and so right. um you know because it is black history month we want to uh, particularly focus on some uh items and issues that impact the black community uh black citizenship and Absolutely. you know all of the things that could very well um kind of diminish our rights. And uh, so today we're going to discuss the critical need for black citizens in Horry County and the state of South Carolina to be highly involved in all things politics. And our panel tonight will share insight on three major dynamics that impact and influence voter turnout, political awareness, and power structures, which can make or break the foundations of African-American community. So joining us tonight, we have Davida Fouché. How are you? I am well. All right. All right. Great. Great. We have Samuel Grant. How are you, Mr. Grant? Good. How are you? All right. And joining us shortly will be Doris Hickman. Uh, she's also going to be a part of this discussion tonight. So uh, welcome to the two of you. It's, it's so wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And want to just remind our audience that if you have any questions or comments for our guests, please make sure you drop them into uh, the uh the post of the chat on Facebook or YouTube. And we certainly do appreciate having you all here tonight. So, um, you know, whenever we were talking about uh, bringing this particular conversation to the to the forefront, uh, kind of the backdrop of it was all surrounding the redistricting um, uh, situation that we have going on. And so uh, our guests tonight are gonna touch upon, you know, that particular issue as well. But I think our overall conversation um, like I stated, it's just going to be about all things politics and why it's important for Black citizens to be deeply involved. So before we, we really get into it, uh, I want our guests to uh, tell everyone who they are and their roles uh, in uh, politics and particularly with the Democratic Party. And then we can get into some discussions about what really matters. So Davida, why don't you start? Davida? Uh, you're not muted. No, I'm not muted. Davida, can you hear me? Okay, why don't you start by introducing yourself? Yes. Okay. Um, I am Davida Fouché. I am the third <laughs> vice chair for Horry County Democratic Party. 
I am also the first vice president for the Democratic Women's Council of Horry County. The right. chair of the Grand Strands, uh, <laughs> Young Dems, the Grand Strand Young Dems, and I'm also a precinct chair. Uh, Brooksville One is my precinct. All right, awesome. all right, all okay. right. And Mr. Right. Grant. Yes, sir. Um, yes, ma'am. So I am Samuel Grant. I am the first vice president of Young Democrats of South Carolina, and I also serve as communications director for the South Carolina Democratic Party Labor and Progressive Caucus. All right. Oh, right. All right. Brother Edward, you like that, don't you? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he is so impressed by young people just doing wonderful things just, like just this. Oh, I, yeah. I actually missed one. I actually mm -hmm. missed one. Sam just reminded me. Um, I'm also the deputy outreach director for Young Dem Young Democrats of South Carolina, too. Okay. Right. Well, you guys are really busy, I'm telling you. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, a, it's amazing that you have found the time in your young lives to really get involved in something that is so critical uh, to to our communities and and i kind of want to start with that you know why did the two of you feel the need to get involved in politics what was happening within your communities that made you take on that charge sam would you like to go first um sure so um i really got involved in politics over the course of the um covid 19 pandemic and it's a funny story because i actually got um inspired to get involved through TikTok. Um, I was just scrolling on my feed as usual, and I saw, um, I, for some reason, I started seeing a lot of political TikToks, like speeches on the um, Congress floor, and I just got really interested. And it's funny because I essentially um, was like, okay, where do I go from here? Like, how does this whole political system work? Yeah. So I had to basically teach myself everything that they fail to teach us in the school system because mm -hmm. like um we're required to take a government class um before we can graduate in uh south carolina in high school however it was just amazing to see how much they left out and how much i had to find on my own so i just started doing my own research formulating my opinions and um about a year later i'm here so <laughs> oh, well wow. That's that's impressive, uh, you oh, know, yeah. that you were so moved to actually learn more, even on your own. Uh, and there's, you know, such a, a, a critical debate about critical theory and uh, all of that going on now in education. And you're right. You know, there are a lot of things that we don't learn. We, we learn about government and politics on a very superficial level, but we we don't know um, and, and do not learn uh, within the classrooms. And, you know, I'll go ahead and say because maybe they don't have enough time sometimes, but we don't learn all of the intricacies of, of of government and how everything is just really interconnected. Uh, and I think that's why sometimes people miss the boat when they don't participate in local elections and they think it's all about national elections and really it's everything is, is connected. So, um, yes. yeah. And so Davida, how did you get involved? Um, I got mad to be honest. I, I was, I'm a mother. And so I noticed how the public schools were um, missing a lot when it came to curriculum. And I wanted to kind of dive into how uh, monies are spent. I wanted kind of like Sam, I wanted to know where our taxes were uh, going, where my tax money was going because it wasn't going to our children's schools. Um, I was, I'm from Orangeburg, South Carolina, so I know, um, and my grandparents were civil rights activists, so I um, know what civil rights looks like, know what grassroots looks like, so that was kind of, I kind of grew up in that, and then when I started having my own family, I was like, hmm, something's not right here, maybe I should get involved, so I went to um, a county council meeting, um, I've been to uh, city council meetings, and just kind of learning um, how the city moves, how the county works, that really got me interested. And I said, I wanted more. I wanted to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, a great man named Benny Swans found me in college at CCU. And he really started mentoring me and um, teaching me some, some ways about politics here in Horry County. And um, I'm indebted to him because without him, I would be completely lost. <laughs> So um, that um, I was the NAACP president at Coastal for two terms. That really got me um, got me passionate about politics. So I've I've been in 
politics and I've been kind of, you know, just learning a whole lot on my own and just kind of maneuvering around, trying to make sure I am involved as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's, that's just really how I got started. And the reason I'm staying is just to be more of an advocate for the issues that don't get a lot of shine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's that's my that's my real passion to be a servant leader mm -hmm. in communities, um, especially here where I am in Little River and, um, you know, seeing just different things that aren't being paid attention to by those in, in the chair. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that, that's something that's really that's really important to me, trying to make sure that young people get involved um, because we are the future <laughs> and trying to make sure that um, uh, certain issues stay in the light. And, and don't get pushed out. Okay, all right. I think Ms. Doris is ready to enter the stream. Ms. Doris, how are you doing? Dad, I'm, I'm <laughs> having the most difficult night with this technology, but I'm here. Well, it looks like you got it. Uh, <laughs> welcome, we're glad that you're here. Yeah, so we've been talking to Davida and Sam, just getting to know them a little bit before we get into the discussion. But, you know, why don't you tell our viewers uh, who you are and, and a little bit about your political career? Uh, I'm Doris Jacqueline, I'm part of Hickman. Um, All right. I am from Dothan, Alabama, a <laughs> state that's been very active in civil rights. Um, I... Um, came to Benedict College where I met my husband who was very active. Um, at Benedict College at 18 years old, there was a group of attorneys who trained us, Matthew Perry, um, Senator uh, Frank Gilbert, and I, Quincy Newman. At that particular time, uh, the uh, uh, counters at Crest and and some of the other stores were not uh, available to blacks. So we were trained to uh, go and protest in a nonviolent way. Um, we had meetings at the bottom of our uh, dormitories and we were told exactly what to do and uh, how to uh, protect ourselves. So I've been active in politics since um, uh, 18, the age of 18, I graduated from Benedict College and I became employed at Whittemore Elementary School because there were no jobs available wow. in business. And hmm. um, it was um, here that I joined and got involved with the Democratic Party. I've been a secretary for... Um, for uh, administrations. Uh, I became the uh, chair of the party. I've been an assistant um, executive uh, committee woman, and now I am the co executive committee woman for uh, the county. I've, I've been on uh, many uh, committees working for the betterment of the county and the student. So, um, my life has been active in politics all along. So, and I enjoy what I do. And I've met many, many people. And I worked on uh, with Republicans too, because when I sat on the board at Lois, uh, not at uh, Lois uh, Healthcare and McLeod System, uh, basically uh, were white. Uh, trustees and one black woman. So mm -hmm. you had to interact and work together. And so far it's worked. And uh, we have to realize that even though we are two party system, we have to work for the betterment of the community mm -hmm. and the citizen. Mm -hmm. It does not uh, <clears throat> profit anyone to be on a board or a committee or become a politician if their goals or goal is not on what's the betterment of the community or the persons uh, who live within the community. So mm -hmm. I am Doris Party Hickman, very active. <laughs> All right. And such a rich history as well. She mentioned that she worked at Whittemore Elementary School. Did you catch that, Brother Edward? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, uh, 
She talked about the year teacher. <laughs> wow. 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 Well, I'm sure, yeah. sure uh, some of our commenters or people who are looking at that, they, they are probably left in awe. Oh, nobody knew that. Probably. <laughs> <She> <laughs> with well mm -hmm. school. But uh, uh, interesting, you you uh, talked about the, the local politics. I, I'm not always, but I guess in, in my you know, later life, I always thought that um, all politics is local. Okay, um, and I hope that, that the uh, well, young uh, well, Mr. Davida and uh, Brother Samuel could, would uh, t kind of um, keep that entrenchment about polit all politics being local. It uh, uh, it has a, a great a greater impact than uh, the state or the or, or the, the, the national politics. Um, and as um, as Hickman mentioned. She had to work with both parties, uh, Republicans uh, also. That's what makes you know, all politics local because we're working for the benefits of our community uh, and whatever it takes, you know, we just have to work with uh, what's there. Okay. I just want to throw that in. Okay, well, thank you for throwing that in. But you're right, all politics is local. And uh, so let, let's talk about, uh, I guess, the local dynamics and, um, how the local dynamics actually really set the stage for everything else that happens uh, along the way. And so uh, one of the, the points that we want to focus on tonight uh, is the education of the community. I think a lot of times people uh, tend to not get involved so much in politics because they don't understand politics. They, you know, or they think that politics are beyond anything that they can control or move or shape or, uh, you know, have any kind of bearing on. And, uh, you know, if you all had to explain to the community what politics really is all about and how they can be a part of it, how how would you educate the community? What would you let them know as far as just, you know, creating an awareness of politics and why it's important to be involved? Anyone? I, I, I'll go. Um, April, first and foremost, I would let people know that politics affects pretty much everything in your daily life. Um, you have to get involved. You have to get in the know. Uh, like I said, one of the reasons I really wanted to get involved is because I saw a lack of education. So that's that's something that, and I can only speak for the Democratic Party, that's something that we need to get in our communities, in our neighborhoods, a whole lot more. Um, I Just today, I, I was just reading through some, some laws, some bills, that were recently passed. And I saw that, you know, um, our uh, Congressman Rice just passed something about um, a new, uh, infra uh, introduced a bill about building infrastructure. And so I was wondering, I was like, hmm, I wonder where he got those funds from. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of people don't know this stuff is happening. A lot of people didn't know about the, um, the meetings that were um, held at HGTC when uh, the redistricting committee was coming together. So getting that information to to the uh, the citizens, getting it in people's neighborhoods, um, that is critical when it comes to, especially the black communities. That is critical when it comes to um, getting funding for our, for our communities, getting um, what we need, our getting our issues solved. Uh, you have to be you have to be uh, connected. Um, to, to you have to be involved to understand the information. So, so personally, I, I would want to see more of um, the party to to just kind of go to our communities, do things in our communities, make sure that we they understand and speak in plain language. Um, a lot of people uh, messaging is 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 really um, a tricky thing when it comes to the Democratic Party. We uh, our messaging is 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 kind of uh, going over some people's heads. So mm. we want to try to make that. Um, plain language. We want to ask people, hey, did you, you know, did you get um, a, a stimulus check? Did you get, you know, hey, thank a Democrat, you know, and did, uh, are you getting um, better water? You know, how's your, how's your water system? You know, let us know these issues um, when we come to see you because we can, we can try to do things to help that. Um, but that, yes, we have to get back in our communities. We have to get back in our neighborhoods to educate and, and, and make sure that people are aware of what's going on locally and statewide. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I most definitely agree with um, Davida on these statements. It is really just a problem of, like I said in my introduction, education, because we're taught the very 
very basics in school. They don't get into the intricacies of how politics affects everything from the school that you go to, to the hospitals that you can go to, the roads you Mm. drive on. Um, People just don't understand that. And I just want to comment, especially on young people right now, um, from what I have experienced in my high school and now being in college, it is definitely a growing sense of apathy towards politics. Mm. It's sort of become cool or um, it's becoming the norm not to be involved in politics or not to care about your elected mm. officials or what's going on. So it really all comes back to education. And when speaking to the Black community specifically, I feel as though we just really need to educate Black voters on the power of their vote. Um, A statistic I saw today, so in 2020, the number of Black eligible voters that were able to vote for the presidential election was around 30 million. And one third of those eligible Black voters were in the nine most competitive states in the country. So our votes have power, and if they didn't, then 50, 60 years ago, there would be no reason why people tried so hard to take that away from us. So it all comes back to education. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> I too agree that education is important, but I also think that those persons who are teaching education have to be involved in the decision-making process. Um, in the past, I was a, uh, Uh, president of the Teachers uh, Education Association. And at that time, uh, Senator Dick Elliott, uh, he trained us. Uh, He said when we were to go to uh, Columbia and to lobby for education, we should bring large numbers of of teachers. Uh, So the legislatures uh, and the representatives of the House of Representatives a general assembly in in South Carolina. And the persons there would be able to see the large numbers of of teachers who would come and who cared about education. So therefore, uh, they would pay more attention. And when we were to um, speak to them, um, invite them out to the galley and give them our concern and if they didn't act upon it he always told us to tell them we will remember in november because Mm -hmm. that large number had an impact on voting for those persons who supposed to be representing us and who were to have the best interest of the students so we lobbied and and when you lobby and you get the interest of the persons representing you, you bring money back to the county. And that money is used to help with the, within the school setting, with the curriculum, with the books, with teacher salaries, uh, with retirement benefits. So those who are involved in the education system itself should be able to lobby, and, and let the persons who are responsible for sending funds back to your county, let them know what you need and the importance of education. And they have greater respect for you and the students. Mm-hmm. Brother Edward, you're gonna, you're gonna say something, Brother Edward? Uh, no. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just, just echoing what uh, um, uh, Ms. Hickman said. Um, it, it's, and I hope our viewers are, you know, are looking at that very carefully. She seemed to be a very knowledgeable woman about another person, okay, about the uh, the local politics and, and the state politics. But, uh, I think you've been with the Democratic Party, Ori County Democratic Party, for a long time. Is that correct, Ms. Hickman? Yeah. Right. Okay. So what do you think needs to be done if, if you see some of the challenges that, that are there now in terms of uh, reach, getting, um, reaching uh, the more young people, like uh, um, uh, Mr. Grant said, that um, there seems to be a trend here where it's not cool to be involved in politics. Well, when you are being asked to be involved in any activity or any endeavor, you you have to see how 
your being your being involved will benefit you in some way and how your involvement can help others it's called shared vision uh i i have a part of this so i'm going to do better because i am a part i see uh where uh if i'm involved in education when i go to college then i should i should have some money uh awarded to me based on the hard work that i have done within my community from some of those organizations or or my involvement will help me elect someone that with student loans will lower the interest rate you you understand where i'm coming or from cancel them you, yes ma'am or cancel them because <laughs> that system is say, broken mm -hmm. i'm a member of the democratic party okay so yes you are but what is it doing for me personally and how can i benefit by being a member how is it going to help my family or my community uh be more uh involved and have more of the benefits coming in our community so people are asking now young people are asking uh I, I don't just want to join something just to be saying right. I'm yeah. joining. They want to see some what action. They want to see some movement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see some movement. Yeah. Right. It has to be productive. Right. Exactly. That's, right. that's yeah, what yeah. our third vice president communicates. What yeah. are you doing for me? I do not see it. Mm -hmm. But you, we have to make an impact and inroad into the mindset that being involved can make a difference in my life and mm -hmm. in my family's life. I want to go back to something Sam said, um, and the, the word he used was apathy, uh, the apathy towards politics among young people. And, uh, you know, I have to kind of examine, or and I think we all should examine why that apathy exists. And, and I think Ms. Potter just, you know, touched upon one of the reasons why. It's because, um, you know, everything that people seem to fight for there seems to be no change and people want to see change they want to know that they're electing people who are going to get in there and do the work and they they've got to see the fruits of the work you know right. um, exactly but also um you know and i and i think that it's great that sam actually was kind of introduced through TikTok because sometimes it's it's an unconventional way of being introduced to politics, but it was an effective way of being introduced to politics. So, you know, maybe that's one of the things that has to be um, examined down the road is, you know, how do we step outside of the traditional grassroots boxes um, to get yeah. to young people like Sam? But I think yeah, the other absolutely. side of it too is um, there is also apathy among people who are not so young. You know, people who have a little seasoning on them, a yeah, little age yeah. on them, uh, because of the very same reason that Miss Hickman talked about. And, um, you know, it's just been happening for so long. And they're like, you know what? There's no need to vote. There's no need to go to the polls. They're not going to do anything. They're not. It, and things aren't going to change. And so, you know, I think as a um, as a community, we have to not only work to, uh, you know, bring about the awareness of the issues, but we have to figure out ways to keep people motivated. Because even if they know that there is an issue, it doesn't mean they're going to be motivated to go to the polls, especially if they feel that nothing is going to happen. So, right. um, you know, part of part of what uh, David and I talked about pre-show also is uh, has to do with the communication factor in terms of how people find out about certain things. And she kind of touched upon it um a little bit earlier, uh, you know, Sam mentioned social media as a means. We, we're on social media right now, finding out about uh, a little bit more about politics. But when it comes down to it, you know, do you think that there is a comprehensive and integrated enough strategy to really get the word out to people? I sometimes feel like the information is hidden or that it's, you know, it's, it's a day late, a dollar short, meaning there's a meeting tomorrow and we're just finding out about it tonight. So, you know, what needs to happen in order to make sure that that, that the communication pipeline becomes more, uh, I, I guess, um, more valid and more relevant and, and, and more timely so that we can get the information? What are some, some things you all have thought about that need to be done within our communities to, to you know, communicate these things besides the, these things besides WCM Live? What can, what can we do? <laughs> what can we do? Um, one, one thing I want to um, highlight is yeah. the like of messaging mm -hmm. if, if you have done something well and you continue to do it well but nobody knows about it 
then you are in error. So we have to have that opportunity and we do to better message and tell what your successes are. Let the people know what you have done, what what you will do, and go ahead and do it. So they can see the, it's like the intangible versus the tangible. Right. Tangible, you will see, I have done this. We have provided scholarship for, for students. We have built homes within the community tell what it is that you have done show the results mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. um and and like uh to credit to mrs uh mrs hickman right now the message is democrats deliver uh from dnc on down that that's the that's the message we delivered on the infrastructure bill and um you can see the changes that are being made um for what April, you you actually said it. We have to integrate our communication. We have to make it more fluid. Um, I believe that if we can, in order to bridge the communication gaps, uh, the generational gaps, we have to be able to um, step outside, like you said, step outside of our comfort zone and say, okay, um, I know to reach the young people, we may need to move on to social media. However, let's not forget our, our veterans of politics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, if they're still looking for, uh, we, we, we can send out a newsletter. We can have uh, flyers put up uh, in their neighborhoods. We can um, make a few bullet points and make sure it gets to um, their, we can put things on people's you know, uh, door, door uh, hangers or something like that in their, in their communities to make sure that they're getting the information that, that we need. Um, to make it more timely, we have to be involved. We have to be on that forefront of when this information comes out. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to, like I said, uh, it was just the 10th that um, I saw that this new bill was introduced um, about infrastructure. So just to know that and then be able to put that message out, put it on several different platforms, um, make sure it gets into the right hands, but give it to the media, give it to the newspapers, give it to um, a lot of the redistricting commi uh, committee meetings, they were put in um, uh, different se uh, several channels. They were on media, they were in the newspaper. Um, but if people don't know where to go look, mm -hmm. they miss it. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's something in the party where we can say, hey, make sure you look at this, okay? Make sure you, you educate yourself on this so that you can be aware. Um, that That's... That's pretty much. Yep, yeah, like just I was just saying, those are pu the meetings were published. They are published. Mm -hmm. um, so I, just to make sure that people know where to go, I think that's a charge to the party. Make sure people know where to go. Make sure mm -hmm. um, that we are, even if it is published, make sure that we get that information out. Um, you got to see something two, three, four, maybe ten times to make sure it sticks. Sometimes, so just um, <laughs> repeating the information, mm -hmm. that's fine. Making sure that people get it and it sticks with them. And then once they get the information, calling them to action, mm -hmm. telling them, hey, this, this meeting is happening. We wanna see you there. Mm -hmm. If something's going on in your county, in your um, in your neighborhood and you don't like it, come to this county meeting, come to this city council meeting, let them let your voice be heard. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way they're gonna pay attention. <laughs> mm -hmm. pay attention to your issues. So yes, that, that fluid communication, making mm -hmm. sure that we are going to the people, finding out what's going on and letting them know what's going on and then calling them to an action to see to make things change. Mm -hmm. Nothing yes. beats reputability. Mm -hmm. Right. But nothing beats that. Mm -hmm. And something Davida just touched on, which I feel is going to be very important in our politics moving forward is um, we just have to, as a political community, if we want to get our message out, then we have to get out of our comfort zone and we have to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we think because we post something on social media or we attend a, um, let's say, a Democratic Party event. Well, when you post on social media like Twitter, that's only going to go to your followers and probably a handful of other people in those same political circles. When you attend a meeting for a specific party, that is only your party and party members that are there. But where what I fail to see is a lot of times we don't go out into the community. 
we don't go to community centers. We don't go to um, just the places where everybody are at, where mm -hmm. the constituents are at. So if we want to improve our messaging, then we have to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. And that is important. Um, you know, uh, and I think that that uh, kind of takes us into, um, you know, basically just the, um, you know, the power that we possess uh, if we exercise the right choices, the choice to be informed, uh, the choice to be involved. And, you know, a little bit later on, we're going to uh, capture all of that in the power of the vote. But for right now, I kind of want to segue into, uh, you know, one of the main things that we want to talk about tonight, which is the impact of the political structure and uh, kind of cover what's happening with redistricting. Um, and as local and state representatives here tonight, uh, you definitely can tell us a little bit more about what's going on. There was a, a question in the thread. Uh, someone is asking, is there a meeting tomorrow evening with the redistricting committee at the courthouse? Uh, do you all know if that is happening tomorrow night? And if there's anyone who's watching, uh, you can drop it into the comments uh, to answer this question. But uh, if you had to kind of, uh, summarize redistricting for people who are watching who've heard the term but aren't quite sure what it means how would you summarize it and then I want Sam to kind of take us into what's really happening and uh, you know of course Miss Doris and Davida can can chime in as well but uh, you know tell us what is redistricting all about yeah so um, redistricting happens every 10 years and it is based off of the information given from the census and that's the first thing I want to hit. It is so critical that we fill out the census. The census is not just a piece of paper that you can ignore, that you can throw away. It is absolutely important because it gives the federal government an accurate representation of the number of people in a certain area in the state, the demographics that make up a certain population of a state. So ultimately, when we are looking at things such as federal funding, and where those federal dollars go in our state, that is all based off of the census. So um, if I live in a neighborhood, in a particular neighborhood in South Carolina, and let's just say I'm not filling out the census, then we I am essentially unaccounted for. I am a person in that community that's unaccounted for. So when we're looking at where to send money for schools, for hospitals, um, for just uh, necessities and things such as that. Well, since I didn't fill out the census, then, okay, that's a dollar that could have gone here that is now going to another county, that's now going to another city because I didn't fill out the census. So that is why it is important that we fill out that census every 10 years. So essentially what's happening with the redistricting process is, um, so after that information is given from the census, um, it goes to the General Assembly, and it is their job to redraw the lines for um, both the state house seats and congressional seats based on the data that was given from the census. So, um, and unfortunately, depending on who controls the legislature in our state, for us, it is the GOP, um, it can lead to gerrymandering, and uh, which is a um, deliberate attempt to draw district lines in a way that is unfair to one particular party. So um, that happened um, a great deal in this redistrict process this year. Um, I know I testified for it. Um, a bunch of other young Democrats testified um, for redistricting hearings and not just the ones at the state house, but the redistricting meetings that were happening all over the state. So, um, Basically, a series of maps were proposed, and at the end of the day, it came down to two. So the first one I want to talk about is Senate Amendment Map 2. So Senate Amendment Map 2 was a map that kept communities of interest together whenever possible. It was a map that was very popular and that would be somewhat fair to Democrats in this state. So basically with Senate Amendment 2, we would have two competitive districts. And a main area of focus for this map was North Charleston. Um, because in the other map, Senate Amendment Map 1, Charleston County was split. 
So not only was North Charleston not in the same district as the rest of the community, but they actually dug into Charleston and put areas of the city of Charleston and Johns Island and West Ashley in Columbia based district six. Wow. So, um, right. So, um, you can go to Senate amendment map one, the map that actually passed and was signed into law by the governor. So essentially in this map, both North Charleston and parts of the city of Charleston are in Columbia based district six. So USC and college of Charleston, are now in the same district, oh, despite wow. being right, despite being a hundred miles apart. And they, the when the GOP proposed this map, they did this on the basis of using gerrymandering techniques, commonly mm. referred to as cracking and packing. So they are splitting up parts of a district and packing those voters into another district. And what I want to highlight, particularly with North Charleston, was the fact that um, they were taking predominantly Black communities in North Charleston and putting them out of District 1 and predominantly Black areas of the Charleston community as a whole and putting them out of District 1. So that way, it reduces the competitiveness. So when Senate Amendment Map 1 passed, there is there are virtually zero competitive districts in South in South Carolina. So there are six that are essentially safe for GOP and only one that is safe for Democrats. And that's District 6, because as you can see, District 6 is the largest district, the district that covers the most landmass on this map. And it's Jim Clyburn's district. Right. But what, what, but what about the population? You said landmass, but what about the population? Do you have any figures? Uh, for that, and I don't know the serious impact of this gerrymandering, uh, the way it's, this map shows it. But are we talking about a huge population in uh, District 6? Black population anyway? Yes. Yeah. So essentially um, what they did in creating this map was um, they put a, they, they basically took a bunch of um, Black communities with predominantly Black voters and all and pack and try to pack them into district six. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. taking black voters away from let's say district one um would virtually like limit these districts uncompetitive mm -hmm. and um basically guarantee a GOP win. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah I, and, and it's it's amazing how this is allowed to happen. I can't believe like in right now this is allowed to happen. This is, but um, and the numbers I think the magic the magic number for each district is about seven hundred and thirty one thousand and two hundred and three people. So if they can get that magic number by like what Sam said, cracking and packing, um, that that's that's what they did, um, and that's and again to reiterate, that's why it's so important. For people to fill out the census, um, because we what happens is that we become undercounted in our communities, and that leads into being underrepresented. Hence, right now we have one competitive district, one competitive district, district and, six, and and that further goes into being underfunded. So, because your representation is low, so now people who you know you didn't vote in the people who are invested in your interests and in our community's interests. So now who are you going to go to? Just you going to write to Jim Clyburn in District 7? You know, what? what <laughs> he's over District 6, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. it's so important that we do our part when, when it comes to sense, with filling out the census, when it comes to going to these meetings and speaking up in these hearings and testifying like uh, several of the young Dems did um, down in Charleston, voting, are, um, making sure people are running who are invested in our interests um and 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 actually electing them so yeah and so things like this that will not happen again in the next that, year. there's a lawsuit in district one um by the naacp and you know in columbia alone they gained five hundred thousand people over the last decade mm -hmm. five hundred thousand in columbia 
and see the 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 six is 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 has increased but when you were going to um interstate 95 the in the increase wasn't there that's Clyburn's six is Clyburn's um, mm -hmm. district mm -hmm. and it's 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 a, a big lawsuit going on in one at, at, as we speak more. yes and i actually want to highlight um um the lawsuits um so basically in the state of south carolina both um the naacp and the aclu have um both filed lawsuits against this map and um in terms of our options or um basically how this moves forward from here i actually want to turn um, our attention briefly to north carolina because north carolina just had a very similar situation with a um, GOP favored gerrymandered map. So just this past week um, in North Carolina, the state Supreme Court um, overruled their gerrymandered map. So two things will happen for them. Their state legislator is going to be given a second chance to redraw the map. However, the court can choose to go with the map that they redraw. Mm -hmm. They can choose a, um, a a map of one of the protesters that um, they proposed that would be a more fair map, or they can bring in an outside expert to draw the map um, in a fair basis that's nonpartisan. So um, it would not be a stretch to say that the same thing could happen for us in South Carolina with these lawsuits. But what is going to be most important in making sure that we get our gerrymandered maps overturned is that we have got to get people educated on redistricting. We have got to um, get the community more aware of how this actually affects them and the tangible results that are going to come from this. And we just have to build public pressure and momentum to essentially let our legislatures know that what they did is not all right. It's not okay by any means, and that their constituents are not pawns on a political chessboard. Hmm. Brother Edward, this is some compelling information. I mean, uh, very compelling. You know, <laughs> we, we're, we're sitting in the comforts of our homes, not knowing that all of this is happening. Um, and not. I don't even want to call it behind the scenes. It's almost in your face, almost. and um, you know, and a lot of it could have been circumvented with more movement at the polls. But, you know, as I think about like that map, that sh the, the map that was, um, I guess, approved and the fact that you have seven, is it seven districts and there's only one, as you say, that, um, you know, really is representative of um, our people. It, it makes me wonder um, how it is that we can move the needle on that you know do do we have the political power and influence and also motivation to flip that because you know i don't know that we have the political motivation because we really don't see enough of us in political races um i don't know that we have the political influence because to be honest we don't know you can't look at us and say she's a democrat he's a democrat you know if that's what it's all about so you know how how can how can that change how you know what actually can be done to make sure that you know this type of thing the momentum of this type of thing slows down or that it it changes at some point because if it was that easy to make it happen uh who's to say that you know the next time around there won't even be a, a <coughs> room for debate it, it may just be something that's like you know this is this is how it is and you know so so how do we combat that well, april i'll tell you a good start uh, um i know you asked them the question uh, a good start is our panel tonight okay we have two energetic young people okay and i hope our viewers are taking note of that and appreciating uh what these uh, uh but Samuel and uh, Davida uh, have to offer, um, and it's kind of like a commentary on what, on on your question there. But um, I just want to let, let the, the viewers know, and and, and Samuel and Davida, we appreciate you so so very much uh, for coming and giving your input like that. 
and of course uh, Ms. Hickman. But we're getting back to April again. Uh, we, um, I think, they're they're providing a good start. That to me, that's my impression of that. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously yeah. a good start, but yeah. you know, we're coming up on an election year really soon. <laughs> And but, so, you know, I, I'm glad that they are, are getting out there. Um, and I mean, Brother Samuel is so eloquent and articulate in what he described. I felt like I was in a social studies class understanding everything that yeah. he, um, yeah. you know, laid out. And, you know, so it goes back to a lot of the things that we talked about, the lack of education and awareness. But still, even, you're supposed to do better when you know when you know better, you do better. That's that's how yeah. you, it's supposed yeah. to work. But it doesn't always work like that. And, you know, one question that came up and, you know, you go back to the census, for example, and, and um, you know, Ms. McIver asked, you know, how can we address those individuals who are fearful or skeptical about completing the census? So, you know, even something is, is what we consider as simple as completing the census, people aren't motivated to do. Uh, you know, when we see candidates who are trying to run for office, who want to make a difference and move the needle, you know, why is it that we're not really supporting them as, as much as we should? You know, there's a complacency that exists. You know, uh, Brother Samuel mentioned an apathy, but there's also a complacency that, that exists. So, you know, what do we do? Before do we, do? we go to that question, I would like to interject that Ori County is one of the fastest growing counties um, that's existing at this particular time. We get thousands of people coming from all over uh the United States, many of these people who are from blue states, when they come to South Carolina, turn red. they forget about the labor union that they have had all the benefits and everything. They become Republicans. We write in loans now. Uh, there's a whole community from Connecticut, which is, is a blue state. They are all Republicans now. So when 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 we talk about the population growth, it's not it's not just one particular thing, but this growth is astronomical. Uh, even when we were when we were doing the redistricting for the county, the county council and the school board, uh, eighty one thousand seven hundred. And, and 38 people, that's the increase in Ori County. And it's going to be more than that the next year. But of these 81,738 persons who added to the population, how many are minorities? You see what I'm saying? So if you have your minority base here and then you have all this influx coming from all over the United States and then they become Republicans, you still have a problem. And the people, the blacks could be voting in record numbers, but if you have an offset, Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. still have a problem. You have a problem. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, Ms. Hickman. That is an excellent point, as a matter of fact. So, Ms. Hickman, how, how long do you think this has been happening? A long time? Because I heard it before coming from the, the uh, local Democratic Party saying that these things are happening. You have people from the blue state coming out and then it's turning, uh, it turned Republican and rest, so to speak. New Jersey coming, so, all the blue states coming, but they change when they get here. So, uh, how long do you think this has been happening out there? This well, is. when I was chair, uh, we we had, and that was in 12 to 14, I was chair of the party. There was a young white woman that came, and she came to the party, and she told us, she said, time I got here, they told, they told me I needed to be a Republican. And she said that I'm a Democrat. And they said, no, uh, you need to be a Republican. The Republicans or the rich group and then they said the democrats are the other that's what the white lady told us that was in 2012. so in essence it is it's like they, a national somehow thing. they <laughs> they find people i don't know if they're at the airport i don't know where they are <laughs> but this is what that young teacher told us and then another thing i i failed to tell you about 
the education system, educational system here, uh, when companies uh, want to come to our state, they check on the schools. Are our schools, excuse me, are our schools, do we have good schools here? Uh, what kind of communities here? So education falls right in line with all of this influx and increase that's coming to our county. Um, April, if I can just touch yeah. on a few of, okay. Um, I definitely have, I'm in several different or, uh, organizations Excuse and me, I've please. definitely seen the, when people come from um, upstate, come down here and they switch. So I know several people who were Democrats, but when they decided to run, they decided to run as Republican. And it was just like Ms. Doris said, they here have the power, the money. They are the ones that are winning. And they see people who run as Democrats, and they don't they don't win. So they, now the 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 feeling is that we can't win. So mm -hmm. that is a that's detrimental to us finding new candidates. Mm -hmm. um, it, you probably know every every other week you're hearing you know especially with HCDP we're asking hey we need people to run we need people to run we need people to run um we can give you the training we can let you know um they have to believe people we have to make people believe and motivate people that we are behind them we will support them when they go to run we will train them educate empower them so that they are confident enough to go ahead and run and serve um we have to be strategic we have to start now we, like you said April. We know there's an election coming. We knew in 2020 there was an election coming. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. knew, uh, you know, back then, and we should have been trying to prep somebody. There should be a Democratic nominee right now running against Tom Rice. Right? right. But mm -hmm. we don't have anybody. Well, we have we have somebody, but we should have more people running. We should definitely have more people running. Um, there, We shouldn't have to be pinching right now trying to find more people. There are several different seats opening on um, that are coming open when when filing starts on March 16th, and and a lot of people are you know really looking at the governor race. That's a popular one. Everybody's looking at the Senate. Everybody's looking at um, the Congress. But there's there's a down ballot. There's local positions opening. County seats are opening. Um, city positions are opening. We have to, like you guys said in the very beginning, politics is local. Once you start and make change in your local situation, you can you can move up that up that ballot. Um, and, that, and that's something that we really need to 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 push to our communities that lo local politics <coughs> starts here. It, it definitely starts here. Um, I wanted to talk about um, what well, I believe it was Ms. McIver who um, was talking about motivating people just to fill out the census. Mm -hmm. It's about education. It, I mean, me personally, I don't mind. I will walk, go to someone's house and say, hey, do you need help filling this out? I can help you. Um, but going into, like I said earlier, going into our communities and saying, it's this is what this will do for you. This will help your schools. This will help your hospitals. This will help the roads, those potholes. This will help your infrastructure, helping to get Wi-Fi to rural areas. That is what people need to know so they become empowered. They, they're they not skeptical. They're not afraid. Just, edu just education, just letting them know what will happen if you decide to go ahead and get involved and, and find people who are also passionate, because they're passionate people about in politics in our mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. But um, it, they may not have come to the local party yet, but they're in their areas doing amazing things. We just need to make sure they're empowered and confident enough to go ahead and take it a step further. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And um, to touch on what um, Davida just said um, earlier about, um, about, um, Lord, what was it? I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, the um, people oh, coming. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the trash uh, point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <laughs> people coming from um, blue states and um, just turning red down here because they're told that that's the only way that they're going to be successful. That's the only way they can win. And a big part of our problem is going to be fighting that rhetoric. Because that propaganda. Mm -hmm. That propaganda. Because a lot of politics is rooted in tradition. 
we have people in our state that are voting red because their parents voted red and their grandparents mm -hmm. voted red. And if you actually take the time and explain to them, I can guarantee a hundred percent that they are not going to agree with everything or with all of the GOP values. I mean, especially in this modern society when bills are being proposed and there are, and you know, values are a question of everyday debate. You are not going to agree with one particular party's practices a hundred percent. Mm -hmm. And like Davida said, it all comes down to being strategic. I feel like a lot of our problem is, it's like we treat every single election like this election is the most important <laughs> election ever. Right. And it's like we need to build, um, we need to build strategic plans that encompass years. Okay, um, what are we gonna do in 2022, 2024, 26? What well, a lot of people do not realize how Stacey Abrams pulled off probably the yeah. greatest political victory of our time in Georgia, mm -hmm. how um, she flipped the state blue for Biden and got two Democratic senators elected. That yeah. was a 10 year yeah. strategy. Right. So this can't just happen at the drop of a dime. Mm -hmm. We have to develop that strategy. We have to develop our messaging. We have to target people, target those swing voters, target those voters who are just voting red because they're, Great, great, great grandmama and great, great granddaddy voted red. And mm -hmm. we have to fight that rhetoric. And that is how we are going to build a culture of success to where one day it doesn't have to be a GOP control legislature just because this is South Carolina. One wow. thing also, you, you, we need to form coalitions. There, there are union workers here. There are senior citizens. Um, they're Asians. We have to form, uh, they're Hispanics, not just black people. Everything, everything is on black. The, the, the weight of the election is always on the shoulders of the black, but we have other, um, uh, groups that we need to nurture and invite in, uh, because it's very important when, when raises come, it, they do not just come to black people. The, every benefit uh, goes to every person within your community, and and each time the um, voting or strategies for election come up, it's always the wait. With the blacks, how to do this? The black, but there are other people we need to bring in. We our even in the Lois area. We have so many Hispanics mm -hmm. in here, mm -hmm. and 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 they need to be a part of of our uh, coalition. Then you have the retired veterans. Then you have a union group. All of those. When when you say blue blue states, that's the composition. Bringing people together. That's the umbrella that you bring the group together and you produce a united front and your voting capacity and numbers increase. But just saying blacks, we need hit. Hispanic is one of the fastest growing <laughs> groups in America. Now the Asians have realized that they aren't uh, in a group by themselves. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you talked about Stacy, Stacy had Hispanics working with her she had different groups she went to south georgia where those farm big farmers are i know about that because when you go into alabama you go through south all of that area big area big farmers some farms are almost as large as 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 lois with the big huge huge tractors but coalition building and unification will build a stronger electorate. We we really have to get to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And oh, okay. how is the question? <clears throat> Come on, Davida. <laughs> <coughs> how is the question? Mm -hmm. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that, uh, or I'll comment on that. Um, 
I, I think the challenge would be in order to engage all of all the other elements, you know, like the Asian and the Hispanics. We, uh, you all, well, one has to make sure that the platform is appealing to them. Okay, and mm -hmm. I don't know if we've met that even across the nation, um, because in some some states we have Hispanics uh, looking at Republicans now. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and that, that same thing could happen. Right in Lawrence, you said a lot of Hispanics in, in Lawrence, but if we don't make the platform appealing to them, you know, they're going to vote their pocketbooks, they're going to vote their benefits, okay, that, or, or what they think should be coming to them. So I don't know how great the challenge is, but seemingly uh, the challenging the challenge is is uh, significant in order to get them to be attractive to to the platform. Uh, uh, you know, and the other question is, uh, uh, are you are uh, are there sacrifices involved that everyone is willing to make as compromise to compromise to make sure that um, the Hispanic, for example, will be receiving or it's attractive to them? Okay, receiving benefits and all that kind of stuff. Because it's going to, it's going to have to be a compromise, in, in, I believe, in yeah. some, and well, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Well, we so. did have um, a couple of Hispanics, uh, and we still have some working in our party uh as interpreters to explain the issues and everything mm -hmm. yeah well you know um we're already into the 8 15 hour and <laughs> it's amazing how you know we usually when we get deep into these conversations brother Ed, we find that the time has gotten away from us but you know one thing that i gather from uh, at least the last 15 minutes of this conversation when I believe that the passion seemed to um, to rise up even more as you know, uh, Sam was talking and Ms. Doris was talking and Davida, yeah. uh, it, three words came to mind. We need to educate, unify, and mobilize. Right. And to Sam's point, we have to do that sooner than later. To Davida's point, we have to do that sooner than later. And Ms. Doris's point as well. So, you know, I, I personally just want to thank um, the three of you for coming on tonight to talk about why it's important for um, you know, black people to be uh, particularly involved and, and represented and present in politics. And of course, because it is Black History Month, we wanted to have that focus, but Ms. Doris is right. You know, we have to have a unified front that is uh, diverse and inclusive in nature. And so if we are trying to bring in other groups, they've got to, to see themselves in the coalition or they won't Absolutely. believe that it's yeah. for them. You know, right. and so as you're building these coalitions and as you're building the, the 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 groups for the political movements, as you're you know trying to bring in young people, uh, Davida and Sam, keep in mind that you know diversity is going to be key because we can't do it alone. You know, it may be happening to us, but it's going to take everybody else to make sure that you know that 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 flow stops. Um, right. You know that that the, the, the uh, you know the the dam is built and and that uh, that pipeline is is kind of plugged um, that pipeline to the disparities that are happening. So um, thank you, Davida and Sam, for getting into getting deep into the fight. And you know I promise that one of you is going to be governor or uh, <laughs> president one day or whatever. I look forward to it. Um, I thought you this know, is a block. This is like a blockbuster movie. Uh, it's, 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 it's a blockbuster. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love it. And, and, yeah, and I'm, looking, I'm looking at yeah, two two of our youth. I, I'm saying youth. You know, I, I, I knew you were adults, but as young as um, you feel. But they, yeah. they are definitely youthful, though. Um, yeah. They're they're youthful, you know, and it, energy, it's so man. encouraging to see the young people. You know, do do this. You know, to get involved in this. And when you talk about Stacey, Stacey Abrams, I mean, that makes me tingle all over. Um, and I hope that Georgia shows up for her like they showed up for her for Biden. You know what I mean? So oh, um, yes. You know what I'm saying? So um, thank you all for the continued work. And of course, uh, anytime that there's some critical issues that we need to discuss, not only for, like you said, Ms. Doris, our community, but for all communities, because we really do need to unify, um, please reach out to Brother Edward or myself, and we'd love to have you back. And we Absolutely. definitely thank all of our viewers who, uh, you know, uh, commented and, and posted questions because, you know, the young people on this show, they need that encouragement. They need to know Absolutely. that you're listening Absolutely. and that's empowering to them that they're being heard. So, uh, Ms. Marjorie McIver, thank you for watching tonight. Great show. Love the youth involved in the generational, generational connection, Mrs. Hickman. And that is, that is true. 
you know, there's several generations represented mm -hmm. here, and that's, that's all. Right. Yes. That's awesome. so, thank you all so much. And Brother Edward, you can have the last word. Well, well guess what? Uh, next week, it's just kind of like a, a blend of that, okay? Yes. Um, I don't know uh, uh, about you, uh, uh, Davida and Samuel. Um, are you uh, aware of um, Mr. Cecil Williams and his um, historical photography? Um, being the only uh, only black museum, black photography mu museum in uh, South Carolina. Are you aware of that? Oh, I wasn't. I wasn't either. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. good. Well, not good, but <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> I'll start to say good, but it's not good because you, you need to be. And April, uh, could, uh, on our on our, we, we are going to we feature them on our um, a cover sheet. Um, that April, don't. Try to get it up there because I know you <laughs> you weren't, you weren't prepared for it. Okay, nope. <laughs> you weren't prepared for it. So, but anyway, uh, next week we're gonna we're gonna have um, Mr. Cecil Williams. He is um, uh, again. Uh, he he has the Civil Rights Museum, the first the first of the kind. And and Davida is is right there in Orangeburg. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brother Edward, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna attempt to pull up a photo of uh, Mr. Cecil so that everyone can kind of get an idea. Keep talking, Brother Edward, get an okay. idea of who, <laughs> who we're talking about, because I don't think they're putting a name with, with the iconic image. Yeah, 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 yeah so, right, yeah. right. But Cecil Williams, uh, uh, again, and, and it's a, um, uh, by the way, he just got a grant, uh, I think he just got a grant uh, from uh, a, a huge entity. Oh, I okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, so now you know. <laughs> now, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know. now you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. He'll be on the show next week. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we're, awesome. we're, we're honored to have him on the show next week. And he's going to give you some more in depth, uh, Davida, because uh, 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 he's located right there in Orangeburg again. Right. And, um, and the photos will take you back, um, I mean, just, just as far as you think, involving the original civil rights uh, movement. Okay. So, and to our viewers, Please look forward to it. Yes. And uh, also, we, we will have uh, someone else to, uh, uh, what, April? Um, yes, we'll have Allie. I'm going to say Allie Crandall and company uh, <laughs> for CCU. They will be here to talk about the Gullah Geechee Community Day event. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a great show. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So stay tuned. Yeah. I hope you all have seen the wonderful comments that are um, coming in here. Uh, Sister Joella McQueen, mm -hmm. she... She is uh, the Whittemore or, or World Community Magazine in full effect. Sister Joella, we couldn't do it without her as well. She says, excellent show. And then Cedric Blaine Spain, he's been watching the entire show. Uh, he says he thoroughly enjoyed the show and each of your presentations. And they did a marvelous job. I could listen to Brother Samuel all day. And Davida, you already know how I feel about you. <laughs> So um, yeah, it's just it's very encouraging. The the future looks really good for it, our. It community. looks really it really looks good. This yeah. is today, today, like I said, I'm telling the, the blockbuster April. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, blockbuster <laughs> movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, everybody. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. And again, you're welcome back anytime. And thank you to all of our viewers. Again, we'll be here next week, same time, uh, same day, Tuesday at 7 p.m. We'll have. Uh, Mr. Cecil Williams and also Allie Crandall and company with CCU to talk about the Gullah Geechee Community Day event. Uh, as we round out, can you believe it, Brother Edward? Uh, next week is the last week of uh, oh, Black History Month. I tell you, please don't. It's, <laughs> it's just the last. It's the last week of Black History Month, but we yeah. Black History 365. So yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. amen. It's all good. That's right. That's 365. Um, but yeah, please join us. Spread the word. Share this. Uh, this broadcast is it's on our Facebook page. You can definitely share it to your pages. And it's also on YouTube as well as WCMagazine.net. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Oh, you are thank you. You're so welcome. Yeah, absolutely welcome. You, okay. You will be back. You will be back. Is that yes. correct? Yes, they point. will be back. They will be back. <laughs> All right, everybody, take care and have a great week. Bye. Same to you. All right. Thank you for watching the World Community Magazine's Hour of Power Live on Facebook with your host Edward McQueen and April Garner.